There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Yes, he is, there is no other king. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor for New Mountain Church. Uh, happy to have you guys here. We are in Luke 7 today. I wanted to ask a question before we really looked at the scripture for that. What was the coolest parade you've ever either been in or seen? Anybody ever been to like one of the big parades? Like what, what are they called? Macy's Day Parade? or Anybody ever been to one of those big parades in here? Nobody? You guys are not exciting. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, no, but you know, I've never been to one of those either, but uh, uh, the parades you know, that I watched when I was a little kid in the town that I grew up in, uh, they would march right down our street and actually right in front of my, uh, what would have been my, my great grandma's house. And uh, we used to always watch the parades and uh, see everybody walking by and marching around and singing and dancing. And uh, it was always a good time. It was always something that was, that was really uh, kind of fun to, to see. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard of, of all these crazy parades where they have these big uh, trailers that they're pulling with elaborate, you know, construction done on it and they're, they, all these floats. They're, they're really cool parades. Um, but today, what we're going to look at is the widow of Nain and, and the fact that she lost her son. I've titled this sermon, The Parade of Life and the Procession of Death. Because yes, we're going to talk about some very unpopular subject to think about for us, and that's death. That is something that is a a hard thing to look at. So I'm going to start off, I'll read the section, and then we will uh, pray and get into the message. This is Luke 7, starting at verse 11. You all have your Bibles? Holy cell phones? Ancient scrolls? Okay, pull them out. Let's do this. Seven... Starting at 11. Soon afterward, he went into a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the, the bear, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much uh, for this, uh, such great gift that we have today, which is to open up your word, to hear from the life of Jesus. Um, We know, Lord, that you have amazing things in store for us. You have different journeys and different paths for all of us to take. And so, Lord, today we we, uh, align with you, Lord, and, and we want to hear from you and be directed from you. So help us today, Lord, to have open ears and soft hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, yeah, so let's jump back up because here at New Mountain Church, uh, just a, a way to understand how we teach here, uh, it's called expository. So we go verse by verse through whole books of the Bible because God's word is so important and it's so powerful that by us going verse by verse, almost word by word through the scriptures, we can really get God's overall present that he's presenting to us in this book. And so it's very important and it's, it's great for us to follow along. We also have Bibles out on the table, out in the lobby. If you need a Bible, there's some Bibles out there. We can, uh, Nancy can maybe grab one if anybody needs a Bible in here. We also have notebooks that we give out for free with a big New Mountain stamp on them because we believe that taking notes is very important. Because listen, like when you're at church hearing the, the, the spoken word of God, there's times where the Lord is speaking to you, 
Maybe it's not even in something I'm saying or something I'm meaning to say, but maybe it's something else that the Lord is working on your heart. And guess what? Writing it down is important because you'll be able to look back at it one day, maybe. You'll be able to look back at where you were at a certain point in time, what you were dealing with, what you were struggling with, what you were hearing from God, and it will benefit you down the line, down the way. So please, if you need a, a notebook, Nancy has some of those as well. They're free, uh, no cost. Um, we just love to really get in the word and um, be able to take notes about it. So let's jump back up to the top. This is Luke 7, starting at 11. He says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. So this is soon afterward. Well, soon after what? Soon after what happened earlier in Luke chapter 7, which is when the centurion, the Roman soldier, the commander, the leader of about 100 soldiers, he gets a hold of Jesus and he asks Jesus just to say the word and heal his servant because his servant is on the brink of dying. He's paralyzed. He's suffering in great pain. And this centurion knows that all it takes is a word from Jesus and he'd be healed. And he was healed. Jesus says, I've, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And so he heals the servant. And so as this is going on, Jesus is attracting a crowd. He has his disciples with him, but he's also attracting people that just want to see this amazing thing that Jesus is doing, this amazing healing ministry, this teaching ministry. He want, they want to see Jesus. And so now they've left Capernaum, that's where they were, and now they're on, way, on their way to a town called Nain, which is just a little tiny town, small, smaller than Tacna. It's this little tiny place, and, and there, there's a parade of people are marching along with Jesus. I, I'm sure they're singing. I'm sure they're dancing. I'm sure they're having uh, jokes and laughing, and it's a great time because what Jesus is doing is he's bringing life wherever he goes. He's bringing celebration and rejoicing and joy wherever he goes. And so people are just parading along with him. A long line of people, it says. It says, a great crowd. That's not just a few guys. That's a, a great crowd of people. That's many people. They were marching and, and, and they were walking along with Jesus to this town called Nain. Now, I remember back in Gila Vista Junior High, I was in the... Marching band. And I'd be, uh, you know, practicing and all that. And, and then we would have the, the privilege of being able to march in the, in the parade down 4th Avenue, right? And so we were, you know, getting ready for it. And I was a little guy back then. And, and you know, you get your drum on there and you, you get all suited up. And I think we were like green shirts and like white pants, you know. This, this would have been back in the, in the early 90s. So like... I'm going, and, uh, and, and we're getting ready, and we start to, start to march, and, you know, we're walking along, <laughs> like just seeing everybody on the sides of the, the road, and like, wow, this is cool. But, but then, you know, you, there's something you got to watch out for, though, because there's, there's horses in the parade, right? And so, you know, the first one got me. It was a landmine. If it would have been a bomb, I'd be dead. You know, I'm going, Ugh! But you just got to keep walking. You can't stop. You can't, the whole band's not going to stop for you, you know. So I, just, I had to keep walking. And, and then I'd see the next one. I'd go. All right. and I, but I'd, I'd have to be watching, you know, ma making sure that, that I don't step in any more horse stuff, you know. I'm, and I'm going. I'm going. And I'm, and I'm, I'm just moving along. And, and this, is, this is moving along in a, in a celebration parade, a, a very happy thing to, to be a part of. But, but you got to watch. Because... You might be walking in a happy parade of life and there'll be those landmines that just, uh, they, they, they jump out of nowhere and, and you step in them and it ruins your day. And so this is part of life. There's a, a happy walk forward in life, but there's always going to be some landmines. There's always going to be some problems and there's always going to be the, the understanding that there's going to be some more coming down the line. And I, I, want to, I want to say something about a, 
a, a bank robber from back in 1870. Uh, this guy, his name was Black Bart, if anybody knows uh, of this character. This guy, Black Bart, uh, it, it talk about, you know, horse stuff. Um, this guy, this, this robber, this um, cowboy, this, this desperado, this bandito, he, he would go and he would rob Wells Fargo's stagecoach caravans. And he would, he would do this for 13 years. He, he robbed 29 Wells Fargo stagecoaches. In fact, he was feared. He was immensely feared. In fact, there was talk about him all over the whole West back in the 1870s. Uh, people were afraid of him. He, they were frightened of him. Even the toughest of cowboys uh, were very scared of this guy, this character named Black Bart. This, this guy, he would, he would come up, he would rob these stagecoaches, and, and he would leave a poem, uh, kind of like an eerie, scary little poem that would add to the fear. So then the next stagecoach that gets robbed, they see Black Bart running, riding up on them, and, and they give up immediately. And, and by, the, by the time you know, things start moving along, uh, he would come and he would rob, and, and the funny thing is, he never fired a shot. He never killed anybody. He was able to use fear to get people to give up, to get people to break. He used fear tactics. There's somebody that we see in scripture that's a little bit darker than Black Bart, a little bit more evil than Black Bart, and he's known as a robber and a thief and a destroyer. And, and, th and this guy is, is using fear on us to get us to doubt who we are. His name's Satan. And he does a pretty good job of it. And his, his boys are right along with him. But it's the fear of this death that he has uh, en enabled us to get into. I mean, in the garden, as Adam and Eve are, are walking out their, their life, he comes and he says, did God really say you shouldn't eat of that tree? And, and he ends up helping the human race to fall into sin. And the Bible's really clear. Sin equals death. Death. This guy is trying to uh, uh, make us fear our life, fear our journey forward, so that we won't walk in life and walk in power and rejoicing. We will just be fear restrained and fear broken and fear beaten and we won't do anything in life because we're too afraid to do it. Satan brings us a procession of death down the line. Let's keep looking. Luke 12 or Luke uh, 7, 12. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a, a widow and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. Do you understand what's happening? There's a huge parade of happy, uh, just joy-filled, life-experiencing people walking into Nain, but at the same time, there's another proceed of people walking out of Nain that are crying and weeping and sad and just destroyed in their soul because of this young man that had, that had died. I mean, just... Take a moment to look at this widow. She lost her husband. Now she's lost her only son. Back in these days, there is no welfare. There is no uh, things in place to take care of widows. It was bleak for any woman who lost her husband and her kids. There was a, a, a habit at this time where people would actually pay people to come and weep at their funerals. Because the more people weeping at your funeral, the more loved you were, the more popular you were. And so you would hire these people, and they'd come out, and they'd just bring it all out. You're like, Wah! You know, they're, and so, so they're, you know, they're probably pretty good at weeping and wailing, and so they're adding to this just, this suffering, this eerie atmosphere of, of dark, depressing suffering. It's just crazy that there's a parade coming in and a procession coming out, and it just, bam. Nothing that God does is just because. It's all for a reason. It's all for a purpose. There's two different processions, 
two groups of people meet. Life is a celebration until it's not. I think about the, you know, and I've seen this too, uh, jazz musicians in New Orleans when they die and the parade that is marching along at their funeral and they bring out the whole marching band. Everybody's in black and they carry that coffin all the way to the cemetery just with trumpets blaring and drums being beaten. But it's a funeral. It's a a sad experience. Death is always looming over us. It's in the back of our mind. I mean, even in good times, there's still that little tick in the back of our ear nagging at us. Maybe making us think, how are we going to die? When are we going to die? Where are we going to die? Uh, there's a story that uh, I want to tell, uh, a Viking story, actually, a Norwegian king, a great Norwegian king back long ago. He was in a battle against another kingdom, and there was one, one warrior in this other kingdom that this king just, he just, he was at war with. He wanted to, to see the demise of this warrior. And so he asked all of his warriors, he gathered them all in front of him, he said, if any of you guys can go out and vanquish that, that other warrior, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. And, and she was a very beautiful woman. Uh, and all of these young men were just, the, they, the thought of that was just amazing, you know. And, and, and the king, you know, he had all these warriors, all these guys, you know, with, with axes and tattoos and, and, and swords and shields. And, and, and one of the guys, though, one of the guys just irritated him to no end. But he, nevertheless, he, he asked all of his warriors, you know, all of you guys, whichever one of you can kill that guy, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. And so all the warriors went out. They traveled the long distances. They tried to figure out how to do it. One guy was able to find the the foe and vanquish him. And he comes back to the king. And out of a knapsack, he pulls the head of that vanquished foe and drops it on the front, in front of the throne. And the king was like, you've got to be kidding me. It's the warrior from his kingdom that he didn't like. But the king's decree, it goes. No reversing it. So the king says, okay, at 3 p.m. today, you will marry my daughter. Get everybody ready. Get the palace put together. Set it up. There's going to be a wedding at 3. But you, 3 p.m. tomorrow, I'm going to take off your head. So the king told the guy, The guy was just, he didn't even know what to experience. He just came back from a long journey of vanquishing a guy, and he comes back, and and he has the the happy experience of being able to marry this princess in this royal palace, but yet the king hates him so much he's going to kill him tomorrow. He doesn't know what to experience. So he goes along with the wedding, this great experience this uh, all the kingdom was there it was filled with joy and there was feasting and there was there was a, a, a great experience they you know they go to their honeymoon uh, suite and it's just he has an amazing experience uh, even at the wedding as they're they're all together and they're eating and drinking he he heard out the window the executioner was sharpening his axe But he just, he just, he put it out of his mind and he just, he just kept hanging out. And, and then later on that night, they're back at the, their, their room, the, the royal palace and, and the room. And, and he's there and he's just having a wonderful night with, with his new wife. But he hears the, of the guys outside the palace building the platform that the execution is going to take place. He has a great night filled with unknowing and confusion, but yet happiness and joy, but yet stress. 
The next morning he wakes up, he has a great morning, and then at 3 p.m. he gets his head chopped off. That's a great end to that story, isn't it? The end. I mean, it's a very easy story to kind of grasp. Uh, we walk this life and we have a great life. Many of us have awesome lives and, and things are going great and, and we have the things we need and we eat food every day, as crazy as that is. A lot of people don't get that, that joy, that privilege, but we are able to do it. We have cars, we have homes, we have air conditioning. We, we have all these great things in our, in our life, but, but yet we still every once in a while hear that ax being sharpened. Our demise, our end, what our funeral will be like. We, we have a great experience in life, but we still hear the, the knocking of, of what will be coming. Maybe 20, 30 years, maybe 40 years into the, into the future, however long we live. Uh, that's, there's only two things that are, that are for sure in life, and that's death and taxes, right? Death comes for all of us. It's 100% accurate. 10 out of 10 people die. But how and when, that's what this, it gets in here. It, it, it works on us. This widow, she was just broken. She was super broken. And I would believe that if she's not so upset because now she's utterly alone. That's not why she's upset. She's upset because this is the second funeral she's had to be at. She already had to bury her husband. And now her young son. But the Bible's really clear about the people of God and what we have, what we have to, I would say, commanded to do is to take care of the widows and the children. This is, this is why uh, it was Christians who started orphanages. It was Christians who started hospitals. It was Christians who take care of people. It was Christians who back in ancient Rome would travel the streets at night under the cover of darkness and jump out and grab the babies that were just thrown out onto the porch for the wild dogs of Rome to eat. It was Christians that take care of people. It was Christians that love people. And so Christians, uh, listen to me. We have to treat other people more important than ourselves. We have to take care of people. I mean, even Old Testament. Let's look at Exodus 22, 22 to 23. It says, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. Or let's go all the way, New Testament, 1 Timothy 5, 3 through 4. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. The Lord has designed the family unit to where when we raise the children, the children should know that there'll be a moment in time where the children are taking care of the parents. It's a cycle that takes place. That's why I tell Fosto all the time that he's so blessed. He's got all these kids around him. I'm like, man, Fosto, you're going to be old one of these days, and you're going to be pooping your pants, and, and your daughters are going to be taking care of you, man. That's going to be so awesome. We take care of the widows for sure, uh, but... There's many times, and this is what 1 Timothy was about, there's many times where there is no children to take care of the widows. And that's where the church has to come into gear, has to click into gear and be able to take care of people, take care of widows. Luke 7, 13 says, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Do not weep. I mean, that is something that at funerals, I don't tell anybody that. <laughs> I don't tell anybody, do not weep. But the Lord is a lot different than I am. Uh, the Lord says, do not weep. He had compassion on her. You know what's super cool? Is that the Wycliffe Bible translators, you know, they go all over the place translating the Bible into other languages. That's, it's pretty cool. I mean, the, there's many different translating um, organizations that do this kind of stuff. But the problem is, is that some countries don't have words that just interchange for our vocabulary. For example, I got a friend who's a pastor in Japan, 
And in Japan, there is no word for sin. And so he had to kind of he had to kind of get creative with how to explain sin. And so he he would he said it's he would use the word crime and he would try to explain it a little bit differently. But these Wycliffe Bible translators, as they went up to the northern part of the Eskimo territory in Alaska, they figured out that uh, the Eskimos didn't have an, a word for compassion. And so they're trying to translate this passage into their language and there's no word for compassion, but they came up with something, they came up with something cool. The, the way that they explained compassion um, in Luke 7, 13, it was, was your pain in my heart. I mean, that's, I'm okay. Yeah, that, okay. Your pain in my heart. Jesus, he had compassion. He had their pain in his heart. He knows, if Jesus knows, that he can handle anything that was thrown at him. I mean, the devil tried to tempt him, tempt him in the wilderness for all those times, and, and Jesus overcame him. Jesus healed people. Jesus escaped being uh, attacked and being stoned to death. He did all these different things. He's casting demons out. But yet he knows that us people, we go through situations where we're broken inside. And Jesus is not just like, ah, get over it. <laughs> no, he has compassion. He has our pain in his heart. He has compassion. I mean, he had compassion with Lazarus' relatives, right? I mean, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. He wept because he had compassion, because he cared. This whole procession, this dark funeral procession is coming out of Nain, this town. And, and, and this boy is being carried in, it's not a coffin, it's called a bear, which a beer, is, which is like an open wicker basket. And it's open, it, there's no top on it. And they're carrying this, this guy out. And that's where we get the, the word for Paul bears, is, is from that. And then he's carrying this, this guy out. It's pretty crazy that uh, in a province in, in northern China, did you know that there is a company that on your retirement day, your retirement present was a customized coffin. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I mean, I don't hate it because I mean it is a very you know utilitarian idea that you you can, you're going to use that one day. Everybody's going to need to use something like that one day. Uh, but that's just kind of dark and morbid. Uh, this, this, this guy, as he's being brought out in this wicker basket, and, and everybody's just weeping and, and, and crying. It, it's crazy to think that, that, that no matter how famous somebody is, everybody dies. No, no matter how powerful somebody is, the end comes for everybody. No matter how rich anybody is, you can't buy your way out of death. I mean, let me look at some people, and you might recognize some of these people. How about this guy? Who's that? John Lennon, yeah, very young John Lennon. Uh, Beatles, right? Beatles, a lot of people love the Beatles, Beatles music. Um, there's a very serious issue with, with Lennon, though, because you know he got to a, a point in his career with the Beatles where everybody loved the Beatles. They were, they were screaming and yelling and trying to like jump on the cars as they're trying to get out of the back of the concert hall. You know, it's just a, a crazy experience. And, and so he's starting to understand, man, you know, we're famous. I mean, everybody knows about us. Well, did you know that actually John Lennon has this quote where in between tours he would study religions, and he said this, Christianity, it will go. And this was according to an article by this lady, uh, her last name is Cleve. He says, it will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right. We, meaning the Beatles, are more popular than Jesus now. Did you know that John Lennon, uh, towards the few years before he was gunned down in front of his apartment, he would be so afraid of his death that he, he made sure that everybody left all the lights on in all the rooms in his apartment as he slept. He would go over and above to, to make sure that there was 
cleanly, everything was very cleanly in his house. That he didn't want to get a virus. He didn't want to get any bacteria. But yet, he was gunned down in the front of his apartment. He was afraid of death. Even though he was famous, even though he was more popular than Jesus. How about this guy? Who's that? Oh, Stalin. <laughs> yeah, Steve. <laughs> oh, 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 Stalin. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, a, that's an accurate way to, to, yeah, to see the picture of Stalin. Yeah, Stalin, you know, uh, essentially uh, communism, atheism, killed millions of his countrymen, horrible uh, dictator. Uh, him and Mao, you know, uh, kind of tried to uh, influence uh, Kim Jong-un's grandfather into communism. And it's just a, a, a horrible, horrible life. And he hurt and destroyed many, many, many families. But he was so afraid of dying that in his mansion, he would never let anybody know which room he was going to sleep in that night. I mean, I think he had like 30 or something rooms. So, I mean, nobody knew, not even his, his, uh, his assistants. Nobody knew. Nobody knew because if nobody knows, then nobody can tell an assassin where he's going to be sleeping. He had one guy that was his, uh, his assistant that his whole uh, sole job was just to hold the tea that he loved to drink. And so uh, when Stalin would want some tea, he would have his servant make the tea and then take a drink. Kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like Nehemiah a little bit, right? Yeah, They'd take a drink. And if he didn't die, then, then Stalin would go, mm, and then he would drink it, right? Crazy thing in, in the biography or the, uh, not the biography, but the story, the, the true story written by Stalin's relatives about the moment, the day when Stalin died. When Stalin died, he raises his fist to the air and just lets out a, and then dies. Almost like in one last atheistic attempt to hate the God that he doesn't believe in, and then he died. Don't matter how powerful you are, Death is coming for you. How about this guy? Anybody know this is more abstract? Who's that? Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. Good job. Good job. Howard Hughes, right? Billionaire. I mean, richer than rich. He, was, he must have had that goose that laid golden eggs, I think. I don't know. But he was super rich, and he got super scared of death towards the end of his life. Uh, he locked himself in a high-rise hotel room in Las Vegas for years. Nobody could come in. And, and, and he was afraid of getting sick. And he was afraid of those gross things out there called people. Ugh. And he stayed in this hotel room for years. And he, he finally, when he died, he, he died a, a painful, sad empty death and his beard was as long uh, past his belly and his n fingernails looked like corkscrews they were so long and he was rich but he died he came for him as well two different processions here's the question you gotta ask which one are you in the one for life the one leading to life or the one to death? We have to ask these questions to ourselves. Are you walking with Jesus into life or walking out life without Jesus unto death? Let's look. Luke 7, 14 through 15. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bears stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother okay we've seen two different processions but now we see two different sons two different sons the only son of a mother was was brought out in a parade of death and made alive while the only son of God was brought into Jerusalem in a parade of life and made to die Two different sons. Can you imagine that? He just says, young man, I say to you, arise. <laughs> and brink, the guy pops up. 
Can you imagine everybody, their reaction to this? Two different sons. This son was dead and on his way to life, where Jesus was, oh, very much alive, on his way to death for me and for you. Let's look at this, Acts 2, 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It says this Jesus, Jesus, Son of God, he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God planned for Jesus to die. God planned for this to happen. And in God's plan, he says, it's saying you, but it's, 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 it's the Jews and, and any of us, essentially, we crucified and killed Jesus. There's times we're lawless men. There's times we let sin get the best of us and, and, and we walk out our life in sin. That's, that's lawlessness. But thank God that Jesus was that price that was paid for us. He was that payment on the cross. But I could just imagine, I could just see this, this parade, this, this funeral procession just bursting into an uproar because the boy that they were carrying out is now alive. And so let's look, Luke 7, 11 through 17, or 17, it says this, fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Wow. What Jesus was doing in Nain was insane in the membrane. A little bit of hip-hop reference there. So we've seen two different processions, right? A parade of life and a funeral of death. We've seen two different sons, right? One son, he was dead and then was alive, and then the Son of God was alive on his way to death. And now we see two different decisions. And this is what we got. Two different decisions John eleven twenty five 25 says this, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. We all have to go through this time in our life called death, but none of us die. We all have to meet the grave, but none of us will be gone. The soul lives on. The soul lives on. And Jesus is saying this. Uh, there's a, there's a, an evangelist from back in the day. His name's Leonard Ravenhill. I don't know if anybody's ever... If you, in fact, if you've got a notebook, <laughs> write that name in there. Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, he has this, uh, this talk that he gave years and years ago. I think this was early 70s. Where he's, uh, he's explaining a, a, a verse like this, and, and maybe even this verse, and, and he's talking about how on his, his evangelistic trips, you know, he'd, he'd speaking in, spoken in, in England for years and, and in America, and he would have to take a boat back in, when, when he was younger, you know. He would have to take this boat from England to America. And he would say that, that on the nights, the evenings, where everybody's just having a great time in the dining room and the, the music's playing and the people are dancing and the, the, gla the glasses are clinking, he would walk out to the bow of the boat and he'd look over the rail and he'd just imagine the dead in Christ that died at sea. And he, would, he said he would yell out, Hey there, you buckaroos! One day you will rise up out of your grave. For us, we have these two different decisions to make. Let's look at this verse. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 16. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep in the Bible, right here it means death. He says, I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say 
unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I always think about this. I think about this. You know, everybody, everybody always asks me, um, is it okay for Christians to be cremated? Um, I mean, is that against the Bible or something? I'm like, no, it's not. Many Christians were burned at the stake. Is it, is, it, is it a sin to, to, uh, you know, to uh, give my body over to medical uh, you know, science? No, it's not. Because it doesn't matter where your body is. It doesn't matter how broken apart your body is. It doesn't matter if it's just dust on the ground. When the Lord comes back, we rise with him. This is the understanding of what it means to die as a Christian. When we die, we graduate we accelerate, we are promoted, we move up. Our spirit is immediately with God. We don't have a body until he comes back because as he comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise. And, I, and we move into a, a time in our life where we have a glorified body just like Jesus did. And everything changes it don't matter if you were burned. don't matter if you were buried. It don't matter if you were part of a medical experiment. It doesn't matter if you were lost at sea. When Jesus comes back, we rise with him with heavenly bodies. And everything changes. And this is where Jesus comes back and he puts all wrongs right. He puts darkness into light. He destroys the evil one and everything is made for life. In fact, the Bible talks about it. Even lions are hanging out with lambs and babies are hanging out with snakes. There's no more death. There's no more destruction. There's no more darkness. Everything is changed in the end and we will be with Christ with heavenly bodies and everything will be different and everything will be made perfect. But this is where we come down to those two different decisions. Choose life or choose death. Those are the only two. There is no other. Choose life. Choose life and not death. Death for the believer is just graduation. It's just a subway tunnel that we go through to meet God. Choose death. If you choose death like Lenin or, or Stalin or, or Hughes, I mean, it don't matter how popular you are. It doesn't matter how, mu how much power you have or how much money you have. It will all fade away one day. It'll all be gone. It'll all be destroyed. Everything you own right now, there'll be a day where someone else owns it. Oh, not me. I'm going to throw all my stuff away. Well, people own landfills. Two different decisions, life or death. I pray that anybody in here, you will not keep playing the game because like any game, there's an end to it. Every video game has a last level. Every board game has a last box. And our lives even if they're a parade, even if they're so happy and filled with joy, all parades come to an end. So please, if you don't know Christ in here today, I am begging you, I'll go that low, I'm begging you to give your life to Christ. To not just say a prayer, but to call Christ king of your life where you are bought with a price, where you're his now, I pray for you that you won't keep going even though you hear an ax sharpening and a platform being built. I pray that today will be that last day that you are choosing death. Death, I said death. I pray for you that this was, this was the day, this was the time, this was the hour, this was the moment where you gave your life to Jesus, Jesus who's in control. Matthew 20, 28 is very clear that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. He, he's in control and he's, he's powerful and one day he's putting all things right. And so I pray that you are choosing life and not death. 
I pray that you're choosing him and not the grave. For the Christian, the grave will not hold us. I want to call the band up as I pray. The grave will not hold us. We will be with God until the moment where we're risen with God. We will experience knowing God until the moment where we are in our heavenly bodies hanging out with God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, for what you do in our lives. Thank you that you didn't leave us where we are, Lord. Lord, we were all in a funeral procession even though we were acting like it was a parade. Lord, we were all moving towards darkness. And, and, and Lord, your word says that, that there's times when the, that sinners love darkness more than light. But Lord, you are the light. And when you flash on us, when you shine on us, when you illuminate our lives, we can see clearly who we are. Sure, we see your light. We see your brightness. We see your holiness, your godliness, your righteousness. But at the same time, that magnifying light is on us. And we see that we are sinners that are lost without any hope. We are on a track, on a trajectory to death. And, and Lord, we don't want that, Lord. Lord, we want to be taken out of that, out of that pathway. So, Lord, we pray that you, you would move in the hearts of New Mountain people, Lord. I pray that you would move in their souls. I pray that you would bring them out of bondage. I pray that you would bring them out of darkness. I pray that you would lighten their life, that you would uh, shine brighter than any light. And so, Lord, give us the, the understanding that, that if when, when the moment comes for us, when the day happens, when the hour takes place where we meet our end, when we take our last breath, when we, when we no longer have the blood circulating to our veins, Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, the steadfast ability to experience that with hope and with life and with expectation.